Joshua chapter 2 tonight. Joshua 2 is um, one of the more familiar stories from Scripture, the story of Rahab the prostitute who hid the Jewish spies and was saved from God's judgment on Jericho. Most of us probably know, if not all of us, this story, but we need to ask ourselves why the author would include this in the text. Have you ever thought about that? It's not really necessary for telling the story of Israel's entrance into the land. We don't have to know this. They could have referred to it in passing, but we have all the details here. Technically, this text is about, or Joshua is about the conquest of Canaan. This isn't really what Joshua is about, and it would make more sense to follow chapter 1 immediately with what we now have as chapter 3, which, which would fulfill the expectations we have in light of chapter 1, right? God had told Moses' his successor Joshua to take the land. It's theirs. The tribes have agreed to take part in this conquest and obedience and submission to the Lord through their new leader Joshua, so let's go. Let's get into the land, but no, we, the author says, I need to stop and tell this story. He deliberately turns aside to insert the story of Rahab, which means it likely held special significance to him. And as Scripture unfolds, we can see more of the significance and why she's included here, but why he goes out of his way at this point to select this material as part of the narrative of Israel's conquest of the land is a bit of a mystery when the text starts out. It's not glamorous, but this story involves the salvation of a pagan a Canaanite, and a prostitute. Israel has just been told that they are going to exterminate the Canaanites from the land that God had given to them. And yet the first Canaanite we meet, the only other named person in the narrative of chapter 2 besides Joshua, is a Canaanite that has faith in God before the soldiers even get there. So, what we expect from chapter 1 is the Canaanites are going to die. And the story of Rahab goes far beyond Joshua 2. We'll find that this story becomes a thread that continues throughout Scripture and speaks to us directly as Gentiles tonight. The wise thing to do in light of God's mighty power and promise of wrath and judgment is to surrender to Him. For it turns out that God is merciful even to Canaanites. His and His people's sworn enemies when having heard of His great power, instead they surrender to Him. The certain wrath of God in judgment on sinners makes His grace towards all people even more unexpected and precious. So let's pray and we'll look together. Father, may our hearts be softened by Your Spirit tonight to receive Your Word in humility. Lord, may we understand what this text, the implications it has for us, what it means, God, I pray that you would renew our hearts with joy and thanksgiving and faith and peace and hope in light of your great mercy. So, Father, please help me preach. I pray, pray that you help everyone to listen, and I ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's start here in verse 1. And Joshua, the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up on the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. So the center, the core of this story is found really in verses 8 through 14. They're sandwiched, of course, between 1 through 7 and 15 through 24. That's intentional. That setup shows, um, intentional by the author, to show that the story is mainly about Rahab's confession of Yahweh's great sovereignty. Notice how the writer um, creates some suspense here. 
particularly at the end of verse 7. If you were reading this and hearing of it for the first time, there are a lot of questions here. Right? Why are the Israelites spies sent in the first place? Right? God had already said he had given them the land. So what do you need to send spies for? Go and take it. Why do you need to do reconnaissance? What were the Israelite spies doing in the house of a prostitute? Was this the only place to stay and hide? And what are Rahab's intentions? Why is she doing this? Remember chapter 1. These, these, the Canaanites are going to be wiped out by Israel through the Lord's power. So what is happening here? Apparently, she wasn't being as uh, secretive as she thought. Right? Word gets back to the king. Why, why does she lie to the king and send the pursuers on a rabbit trail? Why is she hiding the Israelite spies who clearly represent an army that is about to attack her city? Not all of these questions are going to be answered, but the point at the end of verse 7 is that many things are uncertain, not the least of which is, how are the Israelite spies going to get out of the city now that the gates have been shut? They're stuck in there. Well, we actually won't find out until verse 15. So it's almost like the author is saying, don't worry about all that stuff right now. There's something far more important that I need to tell you. And he's telling us what Rahab is about to say is more important than anything else he has to relay to us or any questions that we might have. That also means, by the way, that he's not concerned with uh, nitpicky ethical questions. Like, was it wrong to lie to the Jericho police? What were the soldiers doing in the house of a prostitute, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. If we stop and quibble about these things, we aren't going to get around quickly enough to hearing what Rahab says, and that's at the center of the whole narrative. It's best when we uh, confront things we, we don't really have an answer for. God hasn't given the answer, so we should just let God be God and let Him worry about those types of details. The New Testament says nothing about all those things, but it does speak about Rahab's faith. Rahab's faith in Hebrews 11.31 and James 2.25. So let's pick it up here in verse 8. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. This, this should be shocking to us in light of chapter 1. These are Canaanites. What is she, why is she like this? I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. The reason those two names stick out, by the way, is because those were giants. Those were descendants of the giants of the Nephilim, not easily defeated. Verse 11, And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also would do it kindly with my Father's house and give me a sure sign. First thing that's going to happen is they're going to make a pact with the Canaanites. thought we weren't supposed to do that. That you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. The content of her confession is the center of this story. Of this story. Listen again to what she says. Go back up to verse 10. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. What was the basis of Rahab's faith? Why was she doing all this? Because she had heard about the mighty acts of God and believed in them instantly. Biblical faith is not a leap into the darkness. It's based on knowledge. There's actually data and evidence if we want to find it. One commentator writes that faith is not just a warm, cozy feeling about God. Right? If, if faith grows in us at all, it grows because we hear the truth. When Rahab heard about the power of God, as God declared was the reason, of course, for his mighty acts in Egypt, she surrendered. And she speaks of his majesty in verse 11 here. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. 
for the Lord your God. He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. So God has not left Canaan completely in the dark about what's coming, has He? The whole territory could have surrendered. But her heart, her response is almost completely unique. Her heart melted, and she knew that the Lord was God. She even calls Him by name. She calls Him Yahweh. How had she heard that? Rahab, in verse 11, feels the conviction of faith. In fact, believing what Rahab does is what Israel is called to believe about God way back in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 39. And yet here in just the second chapter of Joshua's story of conquest is a pagan Canaanite prostitute with an Israelite confession on her lips. She may still believe there are other gods at this point to be worshipped, but she now believes Yahweh, Israel's God, is supreme. And she will soon find that He is merciful. Remember 12 and 13? She hopes, now then please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also would deal kindly with my father's house. And give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. That's the evidence of her faith. Genuine faith doesn't stop at the realization that God is powerful and majestic. You can know that from an honest look at nature. Genuine faith wants to take refuge in this God. Rahab needs more than to just know the truth about God. She needs to escape His coming wrath. Faith isn't rooted only in correct belief, but in recognition of our desperate need before God. And what's so amazing is that in a Canaanite, we see faith that not only properly trembles before the majesty of the Lord, and yet also believes that He might be merciful. What could be the explanation for her great faith other than the grace of God already at work in her, preparing her in one of the Canaanites? That's mind-boggling. Even them? I thought they were all just kindling. No. No, and Israel is also, in this passage, then given encouragement about the faithfulness of the Lord. We pick it up in verse 15. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, Go into the hills or the pursuers will encounter you and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward you may go your way. The men said to her, We will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. Then, if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away, and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned. And they, the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun. And they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, Truly, the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. So again, God had already told them that the land was theirs. It's, it's not always that we doubt God's promises are sure, but sometimes we need to be able to feel certain of them, to have some kind of confirmation. And God is amazingly gracious to meet our need, as He does Israel's here, from the most unexpected of sources. So don't discount anyone or any circumstance in how God may use them to strengthen your faith. It might come from a Canaanite. The land is the ongoing concern here in chapter 2 for Israel. We see it focused on verse 1, 9, 14, 18, 24. Are they going to get the land? And now the result of the spies' reconnaissance is that Israel has been assured the Lord will give the land that He has promised. That's all they needed. There's not going to be a secret invasion or an attempt to get into the city like a Trojan horse or something. It's all out in the open air. They're coming. 
There's nothing anyone can do about it. All they find out here is that God is going to keep His promise after all. And so God's Word is sufficient in and of itself. What He says He's going to do, He's going to do. If He's merciful to give us some type of extra confirmation or something, that's wonderful. But really, we could have just they could have just trusted the original Word of the Lord and just went in and took the land. Sometimes due to the weakness of our faith, God will graciously confirm what He's already said to make us feel assured of His already certain Word. You husbands know the uh, power of sending your wife a card or flowers just to tell her that you love her. Now hopefully she knows that and is sure of it, but things like that bring extra assurance, a reminder. Our true and better husband, Jesus, also knows what His bride needs, and He will provide in His mercy. But we can't move on from this chapter and story without taking some time to focus on the beauty of God's grace here. Like I said at the beginning, the narrative doesn't require that we know these details. The, the, the story is about the conversion of a Canaanite, a pagan, an enemy of God. The word for prostitute here is zona. It's the usual Hebrew word for harlot or prostitute. But she could have been uh, a kadeshah, one of the cult prostitutes who served at the Canaanite fertility shrines. But apparently what difference does it make? In biblical terms, a harlot is a harlot. And here's the thing. You find out here that harlots matter to God. To God. She's welcomed for all time into the church of Jesus Christ. We'll read later in 625 that Joshua and the Israelites keep their promise to her. She was saved, her and her family. She dwelt in Israel. In fact, when we read the book of Ruth alongside the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1.5, Rahab married a Hebrew man named Solomon, who was the father of Boaz, who was the father of Jesse, who is the father of David, from whom came the Son of God on the earth. And again, shocking things, amazing things, that a treaty with the Canaanite woman to save her, that's the first thing that happens, and that's something they've been commanded not to do. They're not supposed to make treaties with Canaanites. And now you have a former Canaanite prostitute in the line of the Messiah for all time. These things aren't right. Isn't God concerned about appearances? But mercy triumphs over judgment. God is doing something greater in the world than judgment, beloved. And I suppose all this can be offensive. We can't have this. Right? Church is for the respectable, the clean, the middle, preferably upper class folks that aren't going to bring all their baggage in here and make us all look silly for accepting them. And you know, that's, that's like saying hospitals are only for doctors and nurses, not patients. Only morticians and coroners belong in funeral homes, right? Not dead people. Beloved, who should be in the church but sinners? All this serves to magnify the amazingly unexpected grace of God. It's not cliche, but the body of Christ today is not a club. It's a refuge for sinners who have received the grace of God through the gospel. Rahab's past certainly didn't bother the Apostle Matthew. She's a trophy of divine grace for all time. The shady prostitute from Jericho is the ancestress of Jesus the Messiah. Don't think God is bound and can't work by our sin and our mess and our reputation. He's above these things. He transcends these things. That, this is an amazing story. The, the first glimpse you and I get of Canaan and Joshua is the faith of a prostitute. It's almost as if God goes as far down as He can go to prove to you what He's doing, the long game that He's playing. This is what he's actually after. Judgment is going to come on Canaan. And part of what you see as you read Joshua and, and what you learn about Canaanites is that they, they weren't just these innocent, happy people that God just so cruelly uh, removes from this land. These are horrible, evil, pagan people. These are, there are demonic influences, satanic things, and horrible practices they did. And Later in the book of Judges, the reason you know Israel has fallen so far is that they look just like 
Canaanite nations by the end of judgment. You know your Bible well. You know how Judges ends with all that horror and the woman being cut up in pieces and sent all over because of this horrible night with a, another prostitute. And just It's horrible. And the point of the book is Israel has fallen so far you can't distinguish them from Canaanite peoples. And the first real glimpse you and I get by name of a common Canaanite person is a prostitute that's filled with faith because she's heard the word of the Lord. That's the actual goal. Later in Joshua, we learn, however, that this is not the only shocking moment in the book. In chapter 7, a native Israelite man named Achan and his whole family are cast out and killed by the Israelites. They're stoned to death. Because God said, don't take anything from Jericho. And Achan saw some stuff he wanted and he kept it and tried to hide it. And they were defeated in a battle that they should have won probably rather easily, especially after they see the walls of Jericho come crumbling down. We expect Rahab to die and everyone like her in Canaan. But she escapes God's judgment by identifying with Yahweh and Israel. We expect Achan, a Jew, from the very prominent tribe of Judah, by the way, to live. Right? And, and their fates are reversed. He dies. He is killed under God's judgment, the same judgment he's bringing on Canaan because he stole what belonged to Yahweh. And so we find out very early in the book of Joshua, in the midst of Israel's conquest of the land, that what actually counts before God is submission to his will not ethnic identity. Do we understand how important that is? Right? Being a Jew, a native Jew, did not save Achan categorically. And being a Canaanite did not condemn Rahab categorically. One submitted to Yahweh and is accepted. The other didn't and is condemned, regardless of their ethnicities. We see that all the way back in the book of Joshua in the Bible. A believing Canaanite may join the tribe of God's people while a rebellious native son is excluded. We're not expecting judgment and death to fall on Israelites after Joshua chapter 1, and yet that's a crucial part of the story. So note the unexpected nature of God's grace. Because here's the thing. Maybe Rahab acted purely out of fear, of fear for her life, not fear of God. And so maybe her faith, we, wouldn't, we would say, well, yeah, you're about to die, so of course you would have faith. Surely God would not accept such a weak faith. Apparently He does. She was saved from judgment regardless of why she acted because she had faith in God to deliver her. That's all that you need. You and I want to parse out how genuine something is as though we know and can find out. You and I want to be able to monitor to somebody to make sure they're worth saying that, you know, that person really is a Christian. That person really did mean it when they prayed. And you and I will leave hospital rooms where somebody prays right before they die for mercy, thinking, uh, you know, it, it, I doubt they really meant it. They're just afraid because they're going to die. Mercy is mercy. That's what mercy is. That's what mercy is. Rahab placed her faith in the mighty acts of God that she'd heard about. That's enough for salvation. Even if you're a Canaanite, will you please save me? Beloved, that's enough. She surrenders herself to the Lord. The author of Hebrews has no qualms about the genuineness of Rahab's faith in certain due. In fact, that's precisely what she's known for. Right? The text says, By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Hebrews 11.31. Isn't that something? Let's paraphrase that passage. By faith, Rahab lied. Surely God can't have anything to do with this. I wouldn't presume on His mercy. Right? I mean, we used to talk about all the, when I was in youth group when I was a kid, every week we just we would have our lesson and then we'd just talk. And I remember there being this ongoing deal of uh, if, if somebody broke into your house and everybody was hidden upstairs 
and they said, is anyone else here right now? Is it a sin to lie in that moment? This is what we do as Christians. We create these scenarios, and we, we, we think of Christianity as this purely moral thing, and so, no, you can't lie. I, I, I'm lying. I'm 47 now. I'm not 14 anymore. No, I'm not telling you that people that my wife and children are hiding in the basement. You know, I, I, I don't have this desire to lie and be dishonest and displease God. I love my family, and I believe that the cross will cover that. So I, I, I lie in faith, in a sense. Now, again, for any of you that may be little, particularly I'm thinking of my children that are in the room tonight, that is not, don't ever try to use that at the house. I'm lying by faith. No, you're not. Just don't even, don't even try it. I tried that on my dad. It doesn't work. Okay? So that's, of course, we're, we're not, the, the point of that in no way is to justify whatever sin we want in the name of faith. The point in the context of the story is that nothing is a barrier to God's amazing grace. Nothing. God doesn't require a theological PhD to be there before He saves somebody. How many people that were baptized on the day of Pentecost do you figure had all their faith thought out? They confessed and they were baptized. Instantaneous. There was no like class to make sure they understood what they were doing. And we created all these fence posts and then you have God in Joshua 2, this prostitute saying, look, we know you're going to kill us. I don't want to die. Do you think if I hide you, you'll be merciful to me? If I lie about you being here, do you think your God would deliver me? What's the answer? That we do know. That we do have. It's yes. So again, the, the point is not, oh, so God is okay if you say, no. The point is the nature of God's grace. How unexpectedly powerful and comprehensive it is. He doesn't require that our faith be this perfectly thought out, this all-understanding, all-encompassing, well-informed step. And part of disciple-making is, of course, teaching someone the truth of what Christ has taught and done. Absolutely. No question. But do we really believe that all that's required for you to be saved is the faith that God can save you, regardless of your motivation? Do we really believe that grace is greater than all our sin, even the baggage we bring to our professions of faith. When the witness of Scripture says that even in light of the coming conquest of Canaan and its holy war, a prostitute who only realized that Israel's God truly must be more powerful than her gods and that her doom was therefore certain and so she hoped He would give her mercy for being kind to Israel's spies, is not only saved, That'd be one thing. This woman is grafted directly into the story of Jesus on planet Earth, just like you and I have been. God is not ashamed to be the God of a people that need Him so desperately He would save them even when they don't understand everything. Grace goes further than our sin. It goes further than our identity and what we've done every time. If you ever encounter folks that say something like, oh, I, I can't remember if I told you all this story. If I did, I apologize. I was in Walmart just a couple weeks ago and um, it, was, it was the Saturday before Easter. And I was buying some groceries and uh, the, there were two girls, one girl at the counter and another girl bagging. And they're talking about Easter Sunday church. And the one girl says, I don't even know what I'm wearing tomorrow for Easter service. And the cashier girl, they're probably 20 maybe uh, the, the girl bagging was much younger but the cashier girl goes oh yeah she's like I don't have to worry about that she's like I don't do the whole religion thing and she said I, if I walked into a church I think the walls would fall down on me you know they were laughing and they have this conversation while she's doing everything about how you know she's just not she's not religious enough to go to church she doesn't have enough good nice clothes and all this and um, I'm standing there and I said, uh, it really doesn't matter what you wear to church. And how, how did this really happen? This is not a lie. I just am blanking out on what, how, how we got. Into, but it came, it came up that I was a pastor. I, that's that's okay. That's I'm sorry. I'm telling you the truth here. Now it sounds like what I said was, I said, I said, well, I'm a pastor, and I can promise you, we don't care what you wear to church. 
and they both, because they've been talking, you know, and, and the girl said, you're a pastor? Everybody says, do I really look that? Everybody says that. I did not think of you as a pastor. All right, sorry, I'll grow my hair out. But, um, yeah, and, and they said, I said, it, it really doesn't matter what you wear. And as I was leaving, I said, don't ever not go to church because you don't have the right clothes. That's all I said to them. I don't know what effect that had. My point in bringing it up is, is this. When you encounter someone that has these reservations about church and whether or not they should come and if they're too dirty and too messed up, I'm, I'm telling you right now, okay? This is a leap. I'm telling you, God is at work there. Please don't get in the way. Please. You make sure they know that they're welcome and tell them that you'll sit with them so they don't feel funny if they don't have the right clothes. All right, and I, I don't get that vibe from anyone in our church that we don't want folks here. That's, I'm not, that's not why I'm saying it. I'm saying when the mercy of God, when, when a person has it in their heads that I can't go there because I won't look nice enough, please intervene. Please intervene. You, 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 are, you are always more than welcome here, no matter what you wear. Right? And if that's an issue, then let the pastor talk to somebody about it. Right? But he would give her mercy for being kind to Israel's spies. Grace goes further than our sin and our identity every single time. The certain wrath of God and judgment on sinners makes His grace towards all people even more unexpected and precious. All our sins and weaknesses put up a defense about as strong as Jericho's walls were before God. And we are about to find out what happened to those, which most of us, of course, already know. Nothing can stop God's judgment. It's coming. It's coming. But neither can anything stop His grace where and when He wants to deliver it. Nothing. So rest in the amazing and unexpected grace of the Lord your God and His Son, Jesus Christ, for you. It is enough. 